Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this morning's keynote speech. Um, as part of IGD's People programmes, we're here to support you and your team's personal development from early careers through to executive development. And to keep supporting you at this critical time, we continue to deliver free learning experiences through our on-demand learning hub. We focus our efforts on the topics that are most critical to you, and those include building digital mindsets, resilience training, and mental health and well-being. And it's in this context that I'm delighted we've been able to, to bring to you today Jeff McDonald as a keynote speaker on mental health and well-being. Jeff is a mental health campaigner and business transformation advisor. He knows our industry very well, as he used to be the HR Global VP at Unilever. Um, and I'm delighted that he's been able to join us today to uh, present to you. His presentation will be followed by a 20 minute Q&A and you can type your questions anonymously in the questions box in the control panel. Jeff, over to you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fiona, and uh, good morning to everybody. It's always, uh, it's always strange saying good morning to everybody when people are on mute and the audience can't kind of come back and say, yes, good morning, it is a good morning, or whatever. But uh, uh, wonderful that IGD have given me this opportunity this morning to just um, talk, to, talk to your members on a subject that is, that is very, very important for me as, as, a, as an individual. Uh, and I think it was, um, you know, I think it was Mark Twain who once said, uh, the two most important days in your life, what are they? And usually when I throw that question out to audiences, the response I usually get is that the two most important days in our life is the day we were born and the day we die. And I often wonder why we are so pessimistic about can't wait for the second most important day in our life, which is the day we die. Um, but no, it's not the day we die. Uh, what he said is that the two most important days in our life is the day we were born and the day we find out why we were born. And you know, I had a, I had a wonderful career with Unilever, 26 years working for the business, culminating in, in a role which was supporting the transformation of Unilever under the pupillage of Paul Polman. And uh, we rediscovered a sense of purpose as an organization back in 2009, and, uh, and that rediscovery and beginning to embed that sense of purpose into our brands and into everything that we did within the organization really was the catalyst in its transformation. And uh, 10 years later, that business is, is hugely transformed in terms of its performance. And five years into that journey, I. I saw the, 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 the change, I saw the transformation beginning to take shape, uh, the performance of the business improving, and I kind of thought to myself, I, I wonder if I could do the same for myself. And, and, and part of the development of our leaders, once we had created a sense of purpose, was to also get them to think about the answer to that question, why were you born? What is your purpose? And um, I'm very, very clear on, on my purpose, and, and it's very, very simple. It's to try and create workplaces. And when I talk about a workplace, a kindergarten is a workplace. A fire brigade is a workplace. Um, yes, a Sainsbury's is a workplace. Yes, a Tesco is a workplace. A university is a workplace. An army regiment is a workplace. And my purpose is to try and create workplaces all over the world where people in those workplaces feel that they, hold on, something has come up here. This is turn off webcams, I'm just gonna ignore. Um, my sense of purpose is to try and create workplaces all over the world where people in those workplaces feel that they genuinely, genuinely have the choice to just put their hand up and ask for some help if they're suffering from a common form of mental ill health. That could be depression and that could be anxiety. And I don't think it's a very noble purpose and I'll tell you why. Because in every single workplace all over the world, if you're suffering from a common physical illness, you put your hand up and you ask for some help. 
no problem. So if you've got a bit of flu, uh, right now, if you've got COVID-19, hands go up, go and get the support that you need. Yet we have workplaces in the 21st century. And by the way, you know, Elon Musk was last night going to put the first commercial spacecraft into space last night. Unfortunately, the weather beat him to it, so he couldn't. But in the 21st century, we still have workplaces all over the world where people feel that they can't put their hand up and ask for some help if they're suffering from a common form of mental ill health. I don't know how that can be, I don't know how that can be right. We can talk about our physical health, but we can't talk about our mental health. And it's not only in workplaces. We have friendship groups where we can't talk about some of our feelings. We have families today where it's difficult to have that conversation. And you might say, Jeff, why are you so passionate about trying to create that sort of world? And the reason I'm so passionate about it is it goes back to 2008, and I'll never forget the date. It was, my, it was due to be my daughter's 13th birthday, 26th of Jan, 2008. And at midnight on the 25th of January, 2008, I got woken up. And I got woken up with a massive, massive panic attack. Now, I'd never experienced a panic attack in all my life. I thought I was having a heart attack. Uh, I said to my wife, look, my fingers are tingling, my heart's beating, the bed, you know, the sheets are sweat, or full of sweat because I'm sweating so badly. And um, I thought I was about to have a heart attack. And she said, well, you know, get up, walk around the room, which I did, take some deep breaths. Slowly, the levels of anxiety begin to subside. I get back into bed. I can't go back to sleep because I've got catastrophizing thoughts. My adrenaline is pumping all over my body. I'm petrified if I fall back to sleep that it'll happen again. Anyway, the next day at about midday, I'm in the doctor's rooms. This is on my daughter's 13th birthday now. You can imagine. I mean, I could not even participate in that birthday. But here was a young girl who'd gone through a rite of passage, and it was such an exciting day, and I could not participate in it at all. I'm in a doctor's room, and to cut a long story short, I'm diagnosed with anxiety-fueled depression. Now, when I leave the doctor's room that day, I make a decision that saves my life. And the decision I made was that I would, I would tell people what was wrong with me. You know, I would tell my, my daughters and my wife, I would tell my close friends, and I would tell uh, my employer, uh, in particular my boss. And at the time, some of you might know him as a guy called Keith Weed, who was, we were looking, we were, do, we were looking after, he was looking after the home care division at the time, and I was his HR business partner. And I was lucky. You know, Keith was very, very compassionate. He was understanding. He had what I would call an understanding and a compassionate relationship to mental ill health. He had had a friend who had been ill six months prior, and so he kind of got this stuff. Anyway, you might say, why did that decision to, to tell people save your life? And the reason it did was, you know, I was so na naive about this illness. I mean, let me tell you what, you know, my, my understanding of the word depression, what was it up until that date? I mean, I'm an Arsenal supporter. I don't know if there are any Arsenal supporters out there, but if there are any Arsenal supporters out there, you know what it's like. You get two thirds into the season and then the wheels fall off. But I turn to my wife and say, I'm so depressed about this Arsenal football club. You know, I loved getting outside, doing a bit of mountain biking. I live in the Surrey Hills and I'll wake up on a Saturday morning and it's pouring with rain. And I'll say, oh, I'm depressed because it's raining. Or, um, or I will, uh, you know, I will, I think I'd got to this country. I've been here for about two years. I'm from South Africa in 98. And, and around January time, people used to talk to me about a thing called SAD, seasonal effects disorder. And I used to think, what's that? And they'd say, no, the weather, it influences your mood. And I remember I used to think, oh, what a load of crap. I mean, the weather influence your mood? Why don't you just man up, you snowflake, as somebody like Piers Morgan would probably say. And, um, and here I am on the 26th of Jan, 2008, diagnosed with anxiety fuel depression. But that decision not to be burdened by the stigma, share what was wrong with me, meant that I got the most unbelievable outpouring of love. And you know, talk about love and the power of love. I don't know how many songs have been sung about it, but it's such a powerful emotion. And uh, in my darkest moments during my recovery, just knowing that I was loved is what kept me going. Yes, I got better over a period of time. It took me three months to be able to get back into the workplace. 2010, I had a bit of a relapse. And then in 2012, I lost a very good friend to suicide. And, and, you know, I was walking home, I was walking over Blackfriars Bridge from Unilever House on 100 Victoria Embankment. 
my phone goes, it's my wife. She says, I've got terrible news. I said, what is it? She said, one of your closest friends died by suicide this afternoon. And you know, here was a guy, there's a lovely saying, the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. The brighter the light, the darker the shadow. Ruby Wax, Stephen Fry, Robin Williams, Winston Churchill. Um, and he was that. He brought so much light and love and energy to the world and now he was gone. And I lay in bed that night and I came to a simple, simple conclusion. And the conclusion was that stigma had just killed my friend. There I was now in 2012, learning to recover every day as somebody who might be susceptible to anxiety, fuel, depression, and I was flourishing in many ways, and now my friend was dead. What's the difference? And the only conclusion I could come to was that I'd been able to talk, I'd been able to have that one conversation which set me on a course to recovery, and he hadn't, and instead he died by suicide. That night I wrote to Alistair Campbell, completely out of the blue because he was doing a lot of uh, campaigning in this space. Within 10 minutes, he responded to my email. A week later, we met up in Belsize Park. And ever since that day, November of 2012, he began to open some doors, introduce me to some people, which allowed me to take some tiny, tiny footsteps on a journey filled with a deep sense of purpose. And that is to create organizations all over the world, workplaces, where people feel they genuinely, genuinely have the choice. And I'm not saying today that my friend had if he'd been able to talk, he would definitely be alive today. But what I am saying is there's a tiny, tiny chance, a tiny chance that one conversation might have just put him in a different direction and he would still be alive today. And you know what? That's worth fighting for every single day of my life. And as we've gone into this period, COVID-19, um, you know, it has in many ways we all know, we all know the kind of physical effects of COVID-19. It's been drummed into us by the government and everybody else, the dry cough, um, you know, a temperature. Now we hear that if you've got uh, lost your taste or your smell, you might have it. So we kind of know the physical effects, but there are, and at this time, there are huge psychological effects. And, and, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about those psychological effects, but before I do so, I thought I would just, I would just share with you a framework that informs a lot of my thinking around health and well-being. And, it's, and it comes from the Warwick Edinburgh framework. It's, a, it's work that Warwick Edinburgh universities have done over the years. And our health and our well-being is driven by our physical health, uh, which we, you know, we improve that through sleep, through recovery, through being active, through eating and drinking well. Our emotional health, which is very much our feelings. Sometimes we content, sometimes we sad, sometimes we feeling anxious, sometimes we're feeling angry. Those are, that's our emotional health. And then we get what we call our mental health, which is our kind of cognitive ability, our ability to read a document and remember what you've read, our ability to take some data and analyze that data and make a good decision based on that data. That's our cognitive ability, our mental health. And by the way, mental health is wonderful. When we've got good mental health, we've got good cognitive ability. And then finally, right at the top, they talk about spiritual health. I talk about this concept of purpose, this concept of meaning. And so a lot of what I'm going to say today is very much driven by this overall framework and, and probably the biggest lesson since my crucible moment in life. And I talk to you as leaders in organizations today who are undergoing, you know, who are having to deal with business continuity issues. I mean, you guys, the retail in many ways, uh, some of you have, have been able to and have had to stay open during this time and it's been unprecedented. And you know, and, and, and as a leader and all those different pressures that are coming to you right now, you know, how much time have you been spending on actually looking after and maintaining the most important driver of your performance, the most important driver, which I call your energy. And we get our energy from our health, from our health, how healthy we are. And the biggest lesson for me during this period, and, and not only this period, but since my crucible moment in life, is that the most important driver of my performance, the most important priority in my life is my health. I can't pour from an empty glass. You know, I can't bring the energy to my team, to my family, to my friends, if I'm not healthy. And so I've learned to put aside 60 to 90 minutes every single day to dedicate to trying to do things that will enhance my physical health, my emotional health, my mental health, and having that sense of purpose and meaning in our life. So what are some of the psychological effects of COVID-19? I'm not gonna go through all of these bullet points. I mean, Fiona will make sure that you get some of these slides, 
But you know, I think it's so important right now that we as leaders are cognizant of the psychological effects and that we're sending a message to our teams right now that you know what, it's actually okay not to be okay. It's okay to be feeling a little bit more stressed right now. It's okay to probably be feeling a bit more anxious than you do. You know, it's okay that your immune system might be a bit disrupted right now. So, so these are some of the psychological effects and those are being driven by certain factors. You know, there are factors out there that we really can't control right now. So there's real uncertainty and people are feeling stressed and fearful about the uncertainty. We're having to learn to work from home. Uh, and yes, I know we've always had working from home, but suddenly working from home where you've got to school some children, where you've got your whole family there, with the, with the partners there, with the husbands there, the spouse, the wife, you know, and so, you know, trying to, to, trying to adapt to that. Um, there are financial concerns out there. People are really concerned about their financial security. There are real changes happening in the fa family system. And so these are the, some of the factors that are contributing to those psychological effects. And so therefore, it's actually okay right now. It's okay not to be okay. And you know, in many ways, COVID-19 for me has probably democratized mental ill health. It's democratized it because at this time, I think there are very few people out there that are really are being able to say, well, this has had absolutely no impact on my emotional health whatsoever. Um, I thought that this time is also really important to just be aware of some of the symptoms and, uh, that are related to anxiety and depression. You know, somebody asked me last night on one of these webinars, you know, did you know the symptoms? If you'd known the symptoms, might you have done something different? Maybe that panic attack wouldn't have been the, the last straw to break the camel's back. And, and I think right now it's so important as leaders, as a father, as a mother, as a friend, that we're just in touch with and we understand what are the symptoms related to anxiety and depression. Because uh, if we notice some of that, maybe we could just initiate a conversation with somebody that could just, just save a life. And, um, and I think there's a health warning here. The first health warning is to say, these symptoms, we all experience some of these symptoms. We all experience a dry mouth now and again. We all experience being very restless. We all experience maybe a catastrophizing thought now and again. We all experience being a bit irritable. But if some of these symptoms persist over a period of time and they're with you every single day for more than four weeks, I would really urge you to pick up the phone and to seek a professional as a doctor and have that conversation. Uh, some of the symptoms around uh, depression, you know, are things like sadness, feeling emotionless, a real loss of judgment, a uh, real self-neglect, a loss of motivation, neglect of some of your responsibilities, real change in weight, either overeating or undereating. And again, you know, we all experience some of those things. But if those, ex if those symptoms are persisting for a period of time, for more than four weeks, then please, please uh, phone, phone your local GP and just go and have a conversation. And the other thing that I would say as a leader, you know, right now it's quite difficult to to notice some of these symptoms because a lot of your, the people that you're working with might not be close to you or they're working remotely. And I, and I think the rule of thumb there is, to, is just to remember, you know, we all know one another's normal behavior. You know how your friend normally behaves. You know how members of your family normally behave. You know how some of your colleagues normally behave. And if you notice a shift in, a, in normal behavior and that shift has been persistent for about three weeks, it, I think it's really worth just starting a conversation with that particular individual. Just a few thoughts about looking after your mental and emotional health during this time as leaders, um, you know, so that you have got that energy, you, you've got that, you've got that, um, that you're bringing that energy to the workplace in these unprecedented times. And, and just a couple of thoughts. And, you know, not all, and, and you'll see that the slides are a little bit full. And the reason for that is I've picked out some stuff that kind of works for me through my own lived experience. But, but, but you know, not everybody uh, and not, not what works for me works for everyone. And so, and so they're just some thoughts, some ideas here from lived experience, from data that I've had a look at, uh, a little tips and ideas that you, could, that you could think about. You know, avoiding speculation. Just use only reputable sources on the outbreak. You know, forget about what you're reading on social media and other uh, non-reputable sources of information on the outbreak on the outbreak. Try and stay as connected as much as you can. Uh, you know, connection. We are social beings and we need connection. We need connection with family. 
We need connection with friends. We need connection with colleagues. You know, there's a wonderful book and it's called Lost Connections. It's written by a guy called Johan Hari. And he talks about what he says, as he says, this increased incidence of depression and anxiety that we're seeing in the world, young people, um, you know, uh, the leading cause of death in this country for men between the ages of 28 and 50 is suicide. And, you know, part of, part of the reason he puts forward through his research is he says, we've lost our ability to connect. Although we're in such a connected world, to meaningfully connect with people, we've lost that ability. We've lost an ability to connect to a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose. We've lost our ability to connect to meaningful values in the world. We've lost our ability to connect to nature. We've lost our ability to connect to friends, to family. We've lost our ability to connect to a sort of hopeful view of the world and the future. And so connection and just finding ways to stay connected is so important right now. Try and manage how you're following the outbreak in the media. You know, don't, you know, for me, if the, if the news is starting to stress me, then I stop watching it. And maybe I'll watch it once or twice a week. And so if you're finding that that is happening to you, please, please just manage how you're following the outbreak. Try and anticipate some of your feelings. Try and be accepting more of how you might be feeling. We will have days that we're anxious. We will have days that we're sad. And it's, and it's about trying to accept those feelings. And if those feelings continue, 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 then please just reach out to somebody that you trust, that you could have a conversation with. Try and stick to a daily routine, sort of, you know, trying to keep active, having that balanced diet if you can, having a bit of a to-do list, you know, building a lunch break. I mean, work can be all consuming right now. There's not much else to do. You can't have friends and family around and, uh, you can't, you know, for those of you that are keen on sport, there's no sport to watch on TV. And so, you know, work can be all consuming. You can start at eight in the morning and you can go through until 10 at night. And I would really, I would really urge you to try and put some boundaries around your day. There's time for work. There's time for homeschooling. There's time for exercise. There's time for a bit of play and having a bit of fun, but really trying to, to be strict with yourself in putting those boundaries um, learn to maybe do a bit of meditation or some mindfulness, some breathing exercises. Um, so just a few thoughts in terms of looking after yourself. I'm going to end with a few thoughts on leadership right now. What is it that, uh, that leaders, I think, I mean, this is some work that I've taken from Gallup, who've, uh, who've said that, you know, followers today in this, in this time, they are looking for four things from leaders today. The four things they're looking for is, they are looking for leaders to instill trust. They are looking for leaders who are going to instill some stability. They're looking for leaders who are going to instill some hope. And they're looking for leaders who are instilling compassion in their teams. So it's trust, stability, hope, and compassion. And just some thoughts around that. You know, communicate, communicate as best you can right now so that you can minimize some of that uncertainty. Try and reassure your team members as best you can. And, and you know the introverts in your team? Watch out for them if they're working from home right now. They are probably stressed because they don't think they've got access to you. So maybe you've got to reach out to those people a little bit more so that they feel that they've got access to you. Try and be as inclusive as possible in your group meetings. Uh, encourage as much participation. Those that you don't usually hear from, try and draw them into the conversation. I think this is a time for check in with people, not to check up on people or to check on people. So how about starting each me meeting every morning or whenever you have your meetings, your group meetings, with a bit of a check in to see how people are feeling. And you as the leader, share some of your feelings, some of your vulnerability. You know, if you can be a bit vulnerable with your team, and I always say a great leader is vulnerable with a little bit of skill. If you can be vulnerable with a little bit of skill, that allows others in your team to, to feel that they can be vulnerable, share some of their feelings, and know that they're going to get the support and the guidance from you as their leader. As I said, be mindful of these symptoms around depression and anxiety. And I would love you to send a message to your teams, which kind of says, I want you all to know that I, as your leader, I have a compassionate, I have an understanding relationship to mental ill health. I don't think that somebody who might suffer from depression or anxiety is a snowflake. Winston Churchill was not a snowflake. He was not a snowflake. And so I've got that understanding. Please know that if you're feeling that you need some guidance, some support, or just somebody to listen to. I think somebody once said, you know, we can't always be happy, but we can always appreciate somebody who's going to listen to us. And so how do you send that message out? 
uh, to your teams. How to be alert to those that might be struggling, fewer emails, not responding to messages, complete withdrawal in some of your group communications. Ensure you're aware of the support your business provides to people because as a leader, somebody comes for a conversation with you, you're not, an, you're not a psychiatrist, you're not a therapist. All you want to do is show them love, support, and signpost them to where they can get the help. Trusting and empowering your teams, relaxing the rules, and self-care. Self-care is so, so important. And role model some of that self-care. You know, I think it was an air hostess who once said, to me on an aeroplane. If this plane goes down and the oxygen mask comes out and you've got your daughter sitting next to you, who do you put the oxygen mask on first? You put the oxygen mask on yourself first and then you put it on your daughter. And how often are we putting that oxygen mask on ourselves? And I speak to you as senior leaders in the retail industry today. You are under enormous, enormous pressures, enormous pressures, pressures beyond what you normally have to deal with. All these expectations that your followers are having of you to instill trust, instill stability, instill hope, instill compassion. And there's the whole business continuity thing that you've got to do as well. And so I really would, I would really remind you of this well-being framework. And I'm going to leave you with a simple, simple little acronym that I use, which helps me direct my 60 minutes every single day, some days 90 minutes to dedicate to my own self-care. And the, little, and the little framework, it's called can do. And, it's, and you know, if you can't find 90 minutes in a day to dedicate to your health, then just start with 15 minutes in a day or five minutes in a day. And maybe you can build up to 60 or 90. You know, they're 24 hours in a day. Giving yourself one hour every day to do some of this. Connect, connection, connection, connection. So that might be connect with nature, connect with some friends, connect with some family, just, just, connect find time to get out there and connect be active be active i'm not saying go and run a marathon um but go for a walk get outside get into the daylight we've been so fortunate with the weather well at least where i'm living down in the southeast of england um we've been so fortunate and so just finding a bit of time every day to just be active go for that walk go for that jog go for that bike ride with your kid or whatever the case might be the N stands for nice. You know, just try and be nice to somebody and see what that does. You don't have to have a sense of purpose and meaning in life right now. You might not be ready with that or you're still working it all through. But, you know, right at the top of that triangle is that sense of purpose. It's about, it's about giving rather than getting. It's that act of kindness. It's just being nice to somebody. It can have a huge impact on your overall health. Just being nice to somebody. The D stands for discover. They say, you know, part of looking after good mental health, good cognitive ability, is if you are curious, if you're learning something new. And for people who are struggling with depression right now, one of the things that they can do that they say helps in the recovery, and I didn't know this at the time, is learning a new skill and learning a skill that requires you to use your hands. So it might be, you know, painting by numbers or it might be doing a bit of gardening. Uh, but but it's, it might be a bit of carpentry, but a new skill that requires you to use your hands is, is very, very good for our mental and cognitive abilities. And then finally, the O. The O stands for observe. You know, it's about, it's about, I try and find, I just try and find 10 minutes every two hours to just be in observe mode. And what does that mean? It means standing in the daylight and just observing. Maybe listening to the birds, looking at the blueness of the sky, looking at the changing colors of all the trees and the different greens. And it's just about finding time during the course of the day, maybe every two hours. And if you can't do 10 minutes, maybe try five. If you can't do five, then just do two every two hours, which you take some time out to just recover, to just observe. You remember I said our physical health is driven by nutrition. It's driven by our diet. It's driven by being active and sleep. But the one thing that none of us are really good at, and I was not good at it at all, is learning to recover. Taking those recovery moments during the course of the day just to recover. You know, athletes do it so well. They are so disciplined about their training, but they're also disciplined about their recovery. And we so seldom, so seldom do we take the time out to just recover, to just take those five minutes, those 10 minutes every two hours to have that recovery break. And so as you lead as leaders in these unprecedented times right now, your self-care and looking after yourselves 
And, you know, I know there are a lot of HR people on this call and, and I'm part of your tribe. And, and in many ways, you know, you know, the CEO turns to the HR person, uh, you know, that trusted advisor, if you've got that good relationship with your CEO or, or your business partner, who does the HR person turn to? Who do they turn to? Where do they get their, their support from? And, 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 and so therefore, I think it's even more important these days for you to, to just take that time out, 60 minutes, that's all I'm asking, 60 minutes for some self-care. And if you can do that, then I think you can pour big time from that glass that you've now, that you've now filled. Um, I'm gonna leave you with a few questions that you could ask yourself each day. You know, kind of what are you grateful for today? Who are you gonna check in on today? Not check on or check up on, you're gonna check in and connect with. What expectation of normal are you gonna let go of today? How are you gonna get yourself outside? How are you gonna try and move your body? And what act of kindness, what kindness are you gonna to bring to the world? You know, I think it was Winston Churchill who said, we earn a living by getting, and we earn a life by giving. And so what is that bit of giving, that act of kindness, that being nice, that you are going to, to bring to the world? You know, my final message to you all is that also highly contagious right now, is kindness, is patience, is love, is enthusiasm and a positive attitude. Please don't wait to catch it from others. Go and be the carrier. But you can't be that if you aren't taking care of yourself. And for leaders, as I said, it's about instilling trust, instilling stability, instilling hope, and instilling compassion in the teams that you are leading. Thank you, Fiona, and I'm very, very happy now to open it up for some questions, some comments, some discussion. That's brilliant, Jeff. Thank you so much for all the advice you've been sharing. Um, we're having some questions coming through, so if anyone would like to log a question directly and anonymously through to Jeff, uh, just write it in the question uh, box on the control panel. Um, Jeff, just to, just to kick off, um, you spoke about having um, supportive conversations with people in your teams. Um, can you help us understand what that might look like? And also, um, we've had some comments from people saying that they're trying to have these conversations with their teams, but they're feeling those people are not receptive to that conversation or taking the support that's available. What yeah. advice would you have? Yeah, look, okay, so I think there are two questions there, Fiona. I mean, the first one is, you know, I mean, what does that supportive conversation look like? And, and I think the most important thing to bear in mind is one, I mean, you're not a psychiatrist and you're not a therapist, so you can't get into solutions. Um, I think the, the, most, the, most, the, the most important criterion on a supportive conversation is that you are an active listener for that person. And what do I mean by active listening, Fiona? What I mean by active listening is, you know, we often, somebody comes to us with a problem and we immediately go to the solution. Now, an active listener will play back the problem before suggesting some solutions. And you know, if you're in a really bad state and you go in and you're explaining how you're feeling, just having that played back to you by your boss or your line manager, it really sends a message that my boss or line manager has really, really heard me. That active listening has heard me, it's played back how I'm feeling, and is now making a few bits of advice, a few suggestions, pointing you in the direction. And that's why I think it's so important as leaders to be clear, what, what support is your business offering to people right now? You know, have, you know EAP, they've probably got a, a good EAP provider or, or whatever it is, and about then about signposting and just saying, you know, I'm here to support you. Remember, I mean, I know we, we don't use this word a lot in business, but it's about love. It's about love and compassion and showing that to that individual. It's the most powerful emotion. And I can tell you, it can keep you going. It can keep you going, knowing that you've got a line manager who is just there to support and to listen to you in a very active way. So for me, that supportive conversation is about just being that active listener, directing people, signposting them, and just letting them know how much they are, they are treasured and loved. Um, I think what, I think that, yeah, you know, for those people who are kind of maybe not acting on some of that advice and guidance, I, I think it's really, really important that we respect that decision. You know, some people are not going to want to go 
and, and get the support and the guidance that you are offering. And there could be all sorts of reasons. They might not have a doctor. They might have financial concerns. They might be fearful that they're going to be sent to some psychiatric hospital. They'll have their reasons as to why. And I think it's so, so important that we respect that. We have to respect that. But I think it's important that we are saying to that person, look, if you change your mind, just know that we are here to support you. We are here to help you. Um, and, uh, and please, please, if you need to take a bit of time off, you need to go and do that. But just know that we're here to support you if you change your mind. But I think you've got to respect the decision. The only time I think you have to intervene, Fiona, is if that person, if you actually suspect that that person could harm themselves or that that person could harm somebody else, then I think it's really important that you find a way to intervene in that. But for the rest, you know, I often say, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You know what you can do? You can give it a lot of salt that it might want to drink. And so how do you provide enough salt for that person to maybe then make the decision that they want to drink the water? But, it, but in the final analysis, it's about respecting that decision. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, we've got lots of questions coming through, Jeff, so I'll, I'll ask a few more for you. Um, we've got a question here saying, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how we equip our frontline managers to be aware of mental health issues when they may not feel comfortable dealing with it. Yeah, you know, you know um, Let me start at let me start at thirty thousand feet, and then I'm going to come down to real practical stuff. So, so at thirty thousand feet, my challenge to the community that is on this call, my challenge is the following: If you accept my theory that the most important driver of your people's performance is their energy, I mean, I don't know how many of you on this call are Liverpool supporters, but I don't know where that club has come from in the last two years. But I can tell you, they, they appointed some guy called Klopp, who has brought passion and energy to that club like you won't believe. Look how they're performing. And I, as HR people, I bet you, you do your talent reviews and the people, the high performers, they've got energy, they've got passion, they have that positive attitude. And then you don't all have to be an energy bunny, you know, but they've got that capacity to get things done. And we get our energy from our health, from our well-being, not just our physical health, all of that stuff that I spoke about. And so my challenge is, if energy is the most important driver of individual, team, and organizational performance, why is it not a strategic priority? I bet you every other one of your strategic priorities is about enhancing and enabling the performance of your organization. Why is health not one? And so if we were to think about health as being a strategic priority versus, oh, we'll have a week called the well-being week, and then we'll tick that box and move on and flog you to death for the other 51 weeks of the year, or we'll put a few bananas next to the till in the canteen. Now, if you are going to go to that level of having health as a strategic priority, and investing in enhancing the health of your people like you invest in safety. I always say we spend billions in health and safety. Guess what? It all goes to safety. When is it going to actually, some of the budget going to go to enhancing the health of our people? And if we're going to do that, and I haven't got enough time today to, to explain exactly what that looks like. Maybe we can have another one of these one day um, to see what does that actually look like organizations taking accountability to enhance people's health and also driving a degree of individual accountability because people, individuals have to take some accountability to maintain their health. But the starting point of that, Fiona, would be around breaking the stigma around mental and emotional health. And, and in order to do that, you have to invest in training everybody, in training everybody in the, you know, we do it for safety. And I know we train some mental health first aiders and we have them on the floors and that's great. That's, you know, we're making progress. But I think the reason people are finding it difficult to come forward, to have conversations, line managers not sure what they've got to do, how they've got to deal with this is because we've done no training. And so I think you have to train, train, train. And, and it's simple stuff. You know, it's training line managers. It's training individuals 
You know, peers will turn to peers rather than necessarily turning to their line manager. But I'm not going to turn to my peer if I'm not sure what is their relationship or understanding of mental ill health. And so if we could train everybody, and it doesn't have to be a one-day training program, but 90 minutes, you know, what is depression? What is anxiety? What is stress? What are the symptoms? What does a supportive conversation look like? What does an unsupportive conversation look like? What support have we got out there? And so I think that's where it's got to start. And in that vacuum, if we haven't raised the levels of awareness, of understanding, then line managers are going to find it really difficult to have these conversations. They're going to find it really difficult to notice the symptoms. Individuals are going to find it very difficult to go to their line manager and have the conversation. And so the more we can train and invest in this training piece, as one of the drivers of breaking stigma. There are four others, but I haven't got time to go through all of those today. But in order to respond to that question, that's what I think uh, uh, organizations need to be investing in. Brilliant, thank you, Jeff. Um, we've got another question here um, looking at uh, leaders and how they manage their own mental health. Uh, it says, I found um, what have you found to be the best way of protecting time in a busy diary? And I know your diary is very busy, Jeff, so can you give some advice as to how you keep those free slots and you don't give them up too freely? Well, there's a meeting and it's called Jeff McDonald's meeting and it's got priority over every other meeting. It's about a mindset. It really is. And I, and I, don't, want to, I don't want to sound at all patronizing or arrogant, but I don't want anybody to go through what I went through. I really, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, Fiona. I wouldn't. And I had to learn the hard way, you know, and the old way was back-to-back -back meetings with everybody else. There was no meeting for Jeff McDonald. None, none, ever in the diary. And, and so now there is a meeting for Jeff McDonald every single day in the diary. And it's about that having priority. And in that meeting, Jeff goes for his bike ride, Jeff goes for his run. Jeff goes for his standing in the sun for a while and listening to some music, doing some breathing exercises, you know. And 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 if I was if I was if whoever's asked that question, if they forced me to say, Jeff, you know, what is it that's really been probably the most important of that of that sort of you know that little uh, framework around connect? What's probably been the most important and most difficult? Um, bit of maintaining this discipline. And it's all about observe and recover. That recovery piece is really, really hard. But I think it has a, had a huge impact in helping me maintain good mental and emotional health. And you know what, to all of you out there, I am susceptible to anxiety-fueled depression. 2008, 2010, 2012. I've been absolutely fine since 2012. And it's because I've been so dedicated to that little framework and making sure that I put time aside to address those things. I also watch what I eat and what I drink, a lot of bacteria into my gut because there's a real, real correlation between gut bacteria and your mental and emotional health. But probably the most important thing is, is just finding, is just that recovery time, that recovery time. And you know those little, because we all get little stresses throughout the day, there are these little stresses that are hitting us all the time. And and I've got to have a release valve to those stresses. And the release valve is just taking some time out to recover. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, Jeff. It's come through a couple of times in, in different shapes and forms. Um, and it's essentially around how do you um, support a colleague who you know has mental health issues um, but is also try, you're trying to balance a conversation around poor performance and do that in a compassionate way. What's the right balance to be able to take with that? Well, I think the first, I think the first thing is, oh, yeah, got to be careful. That question in some ways triggers me. <laughs> I mean, the person might be performing badly because they are struggling with depression or anxiety. I can tell you, and that's why I want to build energy into the performance management equation. I want health to be in the equation because performance equals knowledge, skills, behaviors, experience, multiplied by health, multiplied by energy. Don't tell me your people are the most important assets. The energy and the health of your people are your most important asset. And COVID-19 has proved that to all of us. Because when people are healthy, we've seen what's happened to world economies. We've seen what's happened to workplaces. And so we should build health into that whole performance management equation. Now. 
I would suspect that somebody who is suffering from depression or anxiety and is really struggling with their mental health is not performing. I can tell you that was with me. I had all the knowledge, I had all the skills, I had all the experience, but I had no energy. I was ill. I couldn't perform. And so I think that is a, you know, I mean, that becomes, okay, what is the underlying reason for this poor performance? And if it is around mental ill health, then it's about giving that time person time off to recover and get better. If they don't want to go and get help and they are continuing to, to uh, perform badly, you know, then I think it's, you know, then you've got to have a conversation with kind of, well, you know, maybe you've got to go and do something else. Maybe there's a different role. Maybe this role is not the right role for you. Um, and at the end of the day, doing that with as much compassion and as care as possible. But, but I think if the underlying driver is poor, men, is, is poor mental health, then, then we need to give them time to get better and to recover. If they had cancer, we would let them go and get better. If they had glandular fever, we would do the same. But, it's, but you know, there are so many people out there that are, that, are, that, are being, that are being fired from organizations due to poor performance. And you know why? Because they haven't been able to tell their line manager or their boss that the underlying reason is depression or anxiety because of stigma. And we've got to get rid of that. We've got to get rid of the stigma. And then if, when the stigma has gone, then we can have these really open conversations, give people time to recover and get better. If they then continue to perform badly, then you take the necessary action. Brilliant. Thank you, Jeff. That has been a fantastic session that you've been able to deliver for us today. I think your passion for the topic and the way you speak so openly and honestly about your own experiences really brings that topic to life for people and really connects at a personal level. So thank you so much. We've had lots of questions coming through. Um, we will be, re um, we've recorded this webinar, so we'll make it available on our on-demand learning hub for you to be able to share with your teams and peers um, as you see fit. Um, Jeff, do you have anything final that you would like to share with the group um, before we finish the webinar? I'd just like to say thank you to all of you in retail and you know all the work that you've been doing and, and I know that there are certain aspects of retail that are have really, really taken a huge, huge hit, and uh, you know my thoughts are with you all. And for those of you that have that have kept us um, fed and looked after us over this time, a very, a very big thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Jeff. Um, we will finish the keynote there, so we'll give people time to uh, get to their next meetings. Hopefully, a bit of time for a breather in between the two as well. But uh, I thoroughly appreciate your time. We've had some great feedback coming through already, and uh, we look forward to catching up with you again later. Thank you again, Jeff. Cheers. Bye bye.